smarter than I can get into. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome, everybody. The eighth meeting of the 25th Council will come to order. All counselors are present this evening. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance in Spanish. Uh, I'll ask, or in English, excuse me, I'll ask Councillor Grout to do that. And Pledge of Allegiance in Spanish, I'll ask uh, Councillor Pena to do that. And moment of silence prior to that. Thank you, counselors. We will move to proclamations and representation, or presentations, excuse me. Uh, we have two presentations this evening, starting with uh, Director Mariela Ruiz Angel to provide an update on the Albuquerque Community Safety Department. Welcome, Madam Director. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mariela Ruiz Angel. It's very, it's a pleasure to um, be able to present today. I'm going to try to get through this in five minutes, which will be my record. <laughs> so, and Julian, I'm going to just look over your shoulder. I realize I didn't print myself a PowerPoint. Great. So, as many of you know, uh, ACS is a third branch to public safety. So now when you call 911, you'll either get police, fire, or a behavioral health responder. This behavioral health responder majority will respond to mental and behavioral health calls, but along and unsheltered calls, but along with other calls such as abandoned vehicles when needed, as well as needle pickups. Next slide. As, you, as many of you know, two years, it's almost been two years that we announced ACS. Prior to that announcement, though, we had been doing rapid experiment around social service groups that were addressing public safety in different ways, just none that were really making the big impact. It was under, after George Floyd was murdered that we saw that the community came up and really wanted to see a change. Um, it was during that time that in June of 2020, we made the announcement that we were going to try something big and bold and create an actual department. We did a six-month community engagement process. That is something you can find on our reports page, which then defined what we were going to be doing, and then we implemented in September of 2021. Next slide. We have four to five different responders, depending how you see it. Our first is our mobile crisis team, which many of you know. This is our high acuity calls, um, calls for service. This is a clinician and a police officer. This is the only response type that is a co-responder model. The others are all um, alternatives and non-law enforcement. We have behavioral health responders who respond in teams of two. These are our social workers and our counselors community responders who go out to community engagement events, unsheltered individual. They're the ones that do a lot of the, the checking on people at the bus stops. Um, and then we have our street outreach. These are folks that go out to encampments, some of which we are very familiar with, Coronado, uh, Los Altos. Those are parks that are 75 people or more at many times. And then we have our community-oriented response and assistance, our core responder. And this is a very specific type of individual who takes on calls that are a little more traumatic. For example, they were the ones that um, assisted in going out to the two homicides that we saw at the massage parlors um, a couple months ago. Next slide. We, are, um, we asked for um, about a little less than 60 positions, and we filled every single position except for one, which actually just withdrew their, their, um, their acceptance just because it was taking a little bit longer. But ultimately, we filled every position that we asked for and a couple extras that we created during the mid-year review. Next slide. 
So this one I think many of you have seen, and these are reports that you can find on our website, but you can see here in March we saw a very large uptick. That will be because we put a behavioral health responder up at dispatch. So it was a game changer for us because now we actually have a, a actual behavioral health responder who knows what the job is, who can help consult dispatchers on the kind of calls we should be going. You can see that not only did we double the unsheltered individual calls that we went out to, but we took many more welfare checks, many more behavioral health checks, many more uh, wellness checks, et cetera, et cetera. So we didn't necessarily lose right capacity. We increased it and were able to go out to more. So far to date, since September, we've gone out to over 6,000 calls. 3,000, about 3,000 of those calls were diverted calls from PD. This is a huge number for us. It, it helped police, right, not have to go out to those calls, and it helped us be able to really, really just help the community and be the right response at the right time. Next slide. Similarly, you'll see here, um, we have our, what our outcomes are. We go out, we, uh, we provide resources. Most of them, that's what we do. We do have no person found, which is still a call that police and fire would have to go out to. And then we have, um, the other two things I wanna highlight here are ghost calls, as well as um, co-response. So we do occasionally need police and fire. That's completely understandable. Um, it's a very small percent, less than 1%, and really it's, it's both. It's us getting called out by APD and us calling APD. The bleeding between the three departments has been fantastic in a really positive light. Next slide. This one very briefly, as many of you know, the impact on each of your districts. Um, you can see here ACS is across the entire city and has responded to county calls as well. Next slide. Um, this one, I don't want to dwell too much, but I, I encourage looking at it. What this really highlights is that from the time we get a call to the time that we leave, it takes an hour. That is a huge difference from what the current situation is right now for a priority four. On average, it takes two hours and a little bit less than 30 minutes. And priority five, it's an hour and 37 minutes. Those calls can go all day depending on how busy APD is at that time. Next, next slide. Again, we're setting a precedence nationwide. We have become thought partners. People are doing reports on us. The model works. They're getting in the car with us and seeing what this entire new department is really about. Next slide. We sit on different coalitions, locally, state, and federally, um, and, and just really trying to give an update and understanding and work out areas that we still need to work out um, we're not perfect, not we're near it, and I think that as a nation, we're really trying to figure out how do we get this to be a nation model. Lastly, we are trying to re-up, right? We're getting ready for our second year. Um, our hope is to be 24-7. We really thought we could get there this year, but we felt that it wasn't necessary at the moment. Additionally, we wanna make sure that we can respond very purposely to certain districts and certain command areas. It's important that our folks make good connections with people, get to know their neighbors, and have some skin in the game when we talk about right investment in each of these areas of town. Uh, we also are making sure that we hire appropriately. When we ask for what we ask for, it wasn't just a random number, it was really specific because it's something one we think is obtainable, considering that we didn't have an HR person and we still hired less, a little less than 60 people, 58, um, and um, it's what the pipeline that we hold has available. So we're ready to move on, on hiring. And then lastly, it's really about sustainability and uh, making sure that similar to what APD and AFR done, which has been great, we create a nice pipeline, right? We have longevity and ability for people to really create a career within city government. So I, I leave it at that. And um, next slide. And I'll leave with a nice quote. Many of you know Walter, who's one of our responders. and. I'll let you guys read that on your own. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Director. Um, Councilors, any questions for the Director? Councilor Davis, and then Councilor Bassan, and then Councilor Sanchez, Councilor Grau. I think you're gonna be popular for a minute, Director, and it makes me excited to still call you Director. I think we, uh, we got that one right when we put you in this position, and I think these numbers show that um, across the city, everybody's working to make this work for all kinds of reasons. I wanted to point out, I think, uh, and you sort of hit on it, I wanted to point out one of the stats. You brought this up in our meeting a few weeks ago, um, the idea that uh, although there's still a lag between calls to dispatch, these are non-emergency non calls, 
it's taking your staff less than 15 minutes to get anywhere in the city on, on average um, to respond to somebody in need. And so when folks can get to dispatch and get to 911 and 311 and get that data and get that in, I think it says a lot that we have somebody that's there. And I'm extremely excited to see that expand 24-7. I know you are as well. I wanted to ask, I know you have a data analyst that's working in your department. Not every department does, but clearly there's a good reason for that. Um, but what do you think or where are we in terms of getting longitudinal data? We're still too early in this process. But how are we able or how is your, how is your team able to follow up with some of the frequent flyers, identify those intervention points, and sort of where those points are happening? Is it the third time? Is it the fourth time? Are we developing that data? Mm -hmm. What can we do to make this even better? Thank you, Councillor Davis. So we wanted to be really purposeful in our database. Um, we've been working with other cities, working internally to figure out what that beautiful database will look like. Um, and it, there's just not a one size fits all, unfortunately. So we decided to use an ArcGIS, um, which hasn't been super friendly. Um, and we will be now trialing uh, Mark 43, which was the database that APD is moving to. We think that it has the ability to really track what we're looking for as they track some of those um, right, high utilizers, um, it'll help us track kind of individuals who we come in contact with more often. A lot of APD and AFR and ACS share that information anyway, so I think it'll be a good system. However, I will say that there's a very high chance we will have to look into a much more person-centered database, but it's in the works. Um, it's part of why we, right, we, we have a lot of consultants. We just have to kind of figure out what that looks like. And with Gateway, potentially, they're looking into similar databases. So that really, we're trying to work collectively to figure out what that one size fits all. Thanks. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Yeah. Councillor Bas Councilor Bassan and then Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. Director, this is just whenever I hear from you and whenever I talk to you, I think that it's amazing the things that I learn. But also, I appreciate that you really respect that I don't like PowerPoints. So thank you. Um, and for whizzing through that, you did, did a great job with, with the information. I'm just wanting to say thank you, because I think that it's really a heavy lift that you have done, but you've done it really, really well. And I love the different new ideas, even I, you know, we talked, what, a week ago or whatever, and I think that it's really exciting to hear about even just making sure that you have someone from ACS sitting in dispatch now and trying out something new. You're willing to try something to see how it works without a huge, huge leap or a huge investment. And then as things progress and get better, it's, it's clearly evident that you are willing to pivot if necessary, but it's, it's really thorough what you're doing, and I love the collaboration you have with APD and AFR. Thank you, Counselor. And I will, I, I'd like to say, um, I couldn't do it alone. This, take, this took a huge village. It took multiple departments. It took multiple directors. It was a huge lift from our administration, so thank you for that acknowledgement. Counselor Sanchez. Hello, Director. How are you doing? Good afternoon. Good evening. Well, one of the, and we did have quite a meeting, you and I. Yeah, and, finally uh, face to face. There was a lot of information that we went over in reference to your safety, your officer safety. We went over to, we went over a lot of different mm -hmm. things in reference to it. So hopefully you're taking a lot of those things that we talked about into consideration. Um, really appreciate the fact that you did put somebody in, uh, in the call center. I think that's gonna be a really, really big thing for everyone involved. Also, um, one of the things that, you know, data's good, and I know uh, Councillor talked about uh, data being very important, and one of the things that I think is really important is I want to know um, how many calls for service did APD have since September when the program implemented, and how many of those calls did you answer, and what the percentage was in reference to those calls, because I know in APD, they answer I mean, upwards into the hundreds of thousands of calls. So um, what is your actual f footprint in reference to helping the officers do their job? So I think the percentage you're looking for is just like, what is the percent from APD total calls for service? And I think that's going to be a really small number when we're talking about even priority fours and fives. We can definitely get you that number. But I could say that, again, about half of the calls we've taken are calls that came from PD. It's not very much, right? 3,000 calls doesn't feel like a lot, but again, we've got um, the very bare minimum of what we can have for a skeleton crew in regards to getting you know, calls for service and appropriate and appro being make sure we have enough responders to then cover those calls. So um, we hope that we can take more. We know we can take more. And we actually took your recommendation and added another 
BHR, behavioral health responder, up at dispatch. So we're looking to see if that will make a difference in numbers as well. Okay, I appreciate that. I just want to know, you know, when you're looking at data, you want to make sure the program's working. Absolutely. So we want to make sure that we see a good significant amount of calls that are being helped, that are, we're helping APD with, so they can get to the calls that they need to get with, get to. So it's really important that we have those numbers, and I ask for those numbers all the time because we need to see what our accountability is and, and make sure that we have accountability for all the dollars that we spent since spend since that's what our job is. So we want to make sure that we spend the correct amount of you know dollars and we're putting it in the right right areas. Yeah. So thank you for your efforts. I really appreciate it. If you can you know continue to work with uh, with us here on council and make sure that we're actually approach you know moving up and so if we if we if we get the numbers we started out at, at, at a baseline and we want to always be beating that next baseline and beating Absolutely. those numbers so those are the kinds of numbers and kinds of things that i'm looking for and i think the rest of the counselors would agree that we want to see good numbers come in and, it, and if and if this program is really really working well then you're going to see a lot of us here actually supported even more so thank you thank you counselor counselor grout mr president thank you I wanted to say that personally I went on a ride along with you, one of your teams and Walter was one of them and I am very impressed with this team, um, this whole program. I was also very pleased to see them work with APD and how um, you were. they both had a res mutual respect for each other and um, it was encouraging to me. Um, and then, then getting to see how they interact with, with the um, um, people in our neighborhoods it was very respectful, and um, I hope that it works and continues to thrive, and, and you're able to make a difference. I do like it. Thank, Thank you, you. Counselor. Mm -hmm. Director, thanks for your presentation. Thanks for keeping it brief. Um, we, we will have you back, I promise. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, members time. of the Council. And, and Mr. Thank President, if I might just add one yes. point I think is really super important. One is um, we got to thank you all uh, for funding the department and making the funds available to get us moving in this direction. And then secondly, to Councillor Sanchez's point, it's really amazing when now you have a com complete cultural, if you will, shift in the city's response to issues. Uh, it's important to get the numbers for sure, Councillor uh, Sanchez, but when APD now is calling the department to come assist in a call, is really what we were trying to get to, right? So that now we have different expertise coming to assist APD as opposed to wanting APD to solve every problem in our community. And I think that's really the shift that we're really seeing. So the numbers may not be as big today, but the impact that those numbers have, any of those incidents could become a major issue that could go in a very bad direction. And as a result of having more staff available to help who have expertise and training in those areas, uh, we've saved a lot of people's lives. And I think that's really super important. It's part of what we do. And, and I think the department under her leadership, Mariela has done a great job and the department really is doing remarkable work. And, uh, and we thank you for, for your support as well because obviously the funding is, is what makes it make it work. Thank you. All right, thank you. Now we have a presentation from APD Commander Veers to provide an update on uh, speeding on our city streets. And Chief Medina as well, good to see you. President Benton, uh, members of council, thank you for having us here this afternoon. We're going to be giving a presentation on our automated enforcement. But before I get started to that, I think that uh, it's important to point out that there's also a big thank you to council for this. Uh, this process is actually the last step in something that involved great communication, a great partnership with council, and shows what we could accomplish when we work together. Councillor Bazan, Councillor Benton, Councillor Pena, thank you. You helped bring us here earlier last year when we started having conversation about what one of the biggest issues in the city was. We talked about drag racing. As we know, the first step was increased enforcement. I'm happy to say that uh, compared to last year, uh, we've greatly reduced fatalities already this year, year to date totals. Uh, Commander Veer will have some exact numbers for you. Uh, but last year we did have 137 callouts, 88 fatalities uh, in uh, traffic, and that number is down drastically this year. Uh, we've made some adjustments to how we enforce in the morning, and we have our traffic officers giving more tickets. We don't know if this is the reason, but we're also down about 100 uh, traffic.
traffic accidents per month. So uh, I just want to tell everybody thank you for the partnership. Thank you for working with us, communicating with us. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Commander Veers, and we'll stand for questions after. Thank you, Chief. Commander? Thank you, Chief. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. President, members of the council, as Chief said, I'm going to go over a few numbers of some of our traffic enforcement efforts we're doing. Um, obviously, speeding was a huge issue with the city of Albuquerque, so it was one of our primary focuses, that along with racing, modified exhaust, things of that nature have kind of been our focus of our efforts. Um, we've done several operations, and we've just taken a different approach from traffic in order to address those issues. Uh, some of the things we've done is uh, we've concentrated a lot more on a DDAX approach, which is, which is a data-driven approach to crime and traffic safety. Um, so basically, you pair where there's traffic crashes along with um, crime in that area. Uh, we found that to be a lot along the central corridor. So we've definitely stepped up our enforcement efforts along the central corridor all the way from tramway um, to the west side of town. So any area on central um, gets that traffic enforcement. We've done a lot of freeway operations. Obviously, there's heavy traffic, high speeds on the freeway. Those are um, going to be a big issue if there's a crash at those type of speeds. You're looking at fatal crashes occurring. So we've stepped up our uh, enforcement efforts on the freeway to increase that. Um, on the central corridor alone, just since January, uh, we've issued almost 4,000 citations and made 75 arrests. Um, whereas before not doing any enforcement or as much enforcement on the central corridor, um, obviously there was a lot of issues in that area, so um, those have increased. Um, the traffic division has also focused more on the enforcement efforts, especially with speeding, um, versus us just responding to traffic crashes. Um, so we've actually added additional PSAs uh, to the traffic division to focus on taking those crashes. What that does is it relieves the field officers from having to respond to those, but it also relieves the traffic officers to go out and do more traffic enforcement to hopefully overall reduce those crashes. Um, with that being said, from last time, or I'm sorry, from January to now to the same time last year, we've almost doubled our traffic citations. Uh, last year, year to date, we were around 6,000 citations. Uh, this year, we're just under 12,000 citations. Um, and as Chief said, we are down over 100 crashes per month um, just from January to March. And our fatals are actually down quite a bit, too. So obviously, I believe the efforts are working um, in conjunction with the hard work the patrol officers are doing and um, doing traffic enforcement as well. It's not just the traffic division alone. So the field is definitely taking their part of it. Um, we're excited about the automated speed enforcement program coming up. Um, I definitely believe that that's going to be a dual effort with the traffic division. Uh, we're excited to use that data that we collect from the automated speed enforcement program to really focus on those egregious speeders who are going 30, 40, 50 miles an hour over the posted speed limit and who do that consecutively. So we have somebody almost every day doing almost 100 miles an hour through the Gibson corridor where we have one of our test cameras right now. Um, we use that data to send an officer out there, look for that vehicle, and if they catch him doing that speed limit or her doing that speed limit, then they will be stopped and a criminal citation or an arrest will be made accordingly to hopefully change that behavior. So it goes a lot further than just the um, civil aspect of it. Hopefully that'll get people to slow down. It is definitely a force multiplier for APD. Um, cameras can run. 24 hours a day, different times of the day, different times of the week. Um, officers, especially traffic, can't always be out there with the limited resources, so it definitely extends um, that enforcement effort out to the city and get everybody to slow down and hopefully change that behavior. Um, so those are kind of the efforts that we're doing as far as traffic goes related to automated speed enforcement and how they tie together. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you all might have at this point. Councilor Lewis, then Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, sir. Could you break down the uh, so 12,000 citations? I guess talk about the Northwest Area Command, if you would, for a moment. Um, and those citations, the increase in citations from this year over last year, if you could break it down to that command. And then as well as um, just the traffic division, personnel in the traffic division, I'm assuming there is a growth, there's, there's increase in personnel and shifts that are ded dedicated specifically to traffic. Um, but if you could specifically in the Northwest uh, Command. Okay. Um, Mr. President, members of the council, uh, thank you for your question. Um, specifically right now, I don't have that. Um, Chief might have some information as far as the Northwest specifically goes. You know, and, uh, President uh, Benton, members of uh, council, uh, Councillor Lewis, 
That's one of the reasons why APD advocates for us to get questions beforehand so that we could research these questions and bring the proper information to council. So if uh, at any time you want to reach out and just let us know beforehand, uh, either through Isaac or even just reach out directly to me or the commander, uh, we'll be able to get you that sort of information. I think in the last two weeks, almost every member of, of council except for two, I've had a conversation with uh, at length over the phone. So just reach out to us and we'll get that information to you. Mr. President, yeah, I mean, thank you, Chief. I, I, uh, I didn't know you were doing this presentation tonight. I mean, it's certainly not meant to surprise you at all. I, I figured you had the, some of the specific uh, details on the on Central Avenue and some of those corridors. I'd certainly be interested in uh, the you know, Ellison and Golf Course and Unser. And I do believe that in past uh, you know, conversations with the Chief that there's been, you, you put some good emphasis there. And so I'd love to see some of the, just some of the data and the results there because I want to pass them on to our community and talk about you know how we're uh, uh, how we're stepping up enforcement specifically in traffic, and hopefully our, our residents are just seeing more and more of a police presence of uh, you know marked cars that are actually doing traffic uh, you know traffic support. So um, uh, so certainly, I mean, I don't know if, if it I, I could give you a call anytime, Chief, and uh, we can talk about that. Or I mean, certainly would be glad to have some of that data if you could send it to me anytime. Appreciate it, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you for volunteering to have us ask questions. I appreciate that. Um, major issue in a, a district that's near and dear to me, the one I represent, uh, the drag racing on tramway has become absolutely, I'm sorry to say, out of control again, um, mostly in the dark night hours so they can hit other cars that they don't see when they come out of the side streets. Uh, it is, it's, it's really as bad as I've ever seen it up there right now or heard about it. Maybe I just have more people calling me, but apparently it's a, it's a huge issue on Tramway and to some extent on Academy for some reason, uh, on the way up to Tramway. I think they like to make the noise with their mufflers and stuff going up the hill, but if you could take a look at that for us and, and I would like to see what you find out, if it's truly happening as much as I'm hearing or maybe not. But uh, if you would take a look at that, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Councillor Bassan. Mr. President, Chief and Commander, one, I, although I, I know the answer to this through all of the work that we've done with the community, I think that one of the latest um, details that the public keeps bringing up is there won't be any actual enforcement if somebody gets the $100 citation. And I would, can you please explain how that's not true and what will happen if somebody gets a $100 citation, how does their teeth behind that versus if they just don't pay or they don't do community service, it's just gonna go out into the ether and they won't be responsible? Yes, um, Mr. President, uh, Councilor Bassan, members of the council, uh, great question. Uh, that actually has come up quite a bit. I'd be happy to answer that. Um, what's different this time of our approach with the automated speed enforcement program is once you receive the $100 citation, there's actually gonna be a couple of options. Uh, your first option is you can pay the citation and there's different ways to do that. Uh, the second option is there's going to be a community service option, uh, which is a four-hour block of community service that must be completed within 90 days. Um, if you fail to complete that within that time frame, then it reverts back to the $100 citation. And if you fail to pay that, whether it's initially or after you fail to do the community service, um, it'll be sent to collections. There's a third-party collections agency that'll be tied into this program. Uh, if you fail to pay that, you will be sent to collections for that to be um, collected and if you fail to do so obviously that would affect um, the driver's credit um, so it has a little bit more bite to it rather than you just don't pay and then nothing happens and it gets written off whereas the previous program uh, we saw a lot of that President uh, Benton uh, Councillor Bazan just to add to that when I retired and I was a chief of police at the Pueblo of Laguna we also had uh, administrative citations we called them that we issued to individuals and that option of sending them over to a collection agency was very valuable Many times when an individual goes to make a purchase and stuff, they remember and that's at the time they decide to pay their citations. So while it's not perfect, it's a move in the right direction. Uh, next, Councillor Pena, then Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm just gonna reiterate what I've been saying is I just wanna thank everyone who's participated in this, Councillor Benton, um, Councillor Bassan, obviously Councilor, uh, former Councillor um, Senna, and, and really to the rest of the council, to the mayor's office, to APD. You know, this has been a, kind of a long haul. We've talked about um, initially how, uh, you know, we've had issues of speeding in all our respective districts, and we decided to um, create a small working group of people just to put our heads together to try to come up with some ideas. 
initially, you know, we um, talked about education awareness through the signs, and, and thank you to Erica Chavez's family, who was the one that stepped up and really wanted to loan um, her, their family um, sister's name, Erica Chavez, who unfortunately um, lost her life very tragically um, due to speeding. And, you know, so it was really a real collective effort to make sure that we got to where we're at now. And with the speed enforcement, I think this is really going to go a lot further. So um, I'm happy to hear that we've had a significant decline because when we started this, we kind of were wrapping our heads around the fact that it was just really um, out of hand. And I'm glad to hear um, it seems like it, everything's coming together. So thank you all for all your work. And President Benton, Councilor Penny, I want to tell you thank, all you guys thanks once again also because there are other aspects like you mentioned. The, the speeding has a name, uh, educational campaign where we shot the commercials. It was a big success. We got the word out there about the dangers of speeding. And then above that, uh, Deputy Chief Brown has been working because not only was speeding a problem, the loud exhausts were a huge problem. And, and Councilor Benton, I mean, that impacted you probably the most of all the area command. Deputy Chief Brown, has we sent a letter to every single business that we knew sold mufflers in an attempt to remind them that there's a city ordinance that violated that they were violating if they sold them and they installed them we've had an officer going out uh, attempting to buy them and just giving them warning citations and we're in the process of making sure we have a cease and desist letter that's sent from uh city legal to these businesses to remind them that there could be consequences if they continue to do these types of activities so this process you know i look at it and i see how we had a, a branch that was involved in education we had a preventive branch that was out there doing stuff like going to those businesses. And ultimately, finally, we have this enforcement branch with our traffic officers being out, uh, giving more citations, and we're just adding to that enforcement branch through the automated uh, citation process. Thank you. Councillor Sanchez. Commander, thanks for the information. Um, one of the things that I did notice that in my area, I did notice a significant uh, uh, presence of the traffic unit on Coors. I've noticed them helping me out in different areas when I've actually sent messages to to uh, Lieutenant Willer, and he's actually helped out really well in addressing some of the target areas that we really, really needed some help at. And so I have seen a significant reduction. The same people that were calling and complaining have not called and complained as much. Um, and so I feel that it's, it's actually gone down. I also have a question about um, the fatals. You said, uh, January to now, uh, the 6,000 citation, 12, uh, 6,000 before, and then 12,000 now. What are what are the numbers on the fatal accidents? How many fatal accidents did we reduce um, in that amount of time? <clears throat> Mr. President, uh, Councilor Sanchez, members of the council. Um, so from 2021, January to this same time last year, we were at 21 traffic fatalities. Uh, this year, 2022, same time frame, we're at 13 traffic fatalities. Thank you. Those are the kind of numbers we want to really see to make sure that our efforts are really working and that our programs are doing what they're supposed to do. Also have another um, comment real quick. Um, I have seen a lot of speeding in uh, the area up and down Central. And based on the fact that um, I don't see it as much now, I think that the crackdown has made a difference. We're looking at uh, two different things. The last time we had cameras that were red light cameras, this is speed cameras. These cameras are going to help um, the officers with with their enforcement and what they do. I'd still really like to see a, more traffic units uh, because cameras will take a picture, but they're not going to arrest um, the individual who's who's speeding, who has that felony warrant, who has that misdemeanor warrant, who just committed that um, that domestic violence or that's driving with a DWI that just ran through that camera. So I honestly think that this is a good thing, but I think that we need to really beef up the other areas as well so that we can actually, and I think speeding is, is speeding and traffic is probably the most critical uh, area um, where you can make a difference in law enforcement because you're gonna catch all those individuals, the scofflaws that are out there running around that that have not been, um, that are running around with, that, with, a, with a free, Ticket to ride, so to speak. President Vinton, uh, Councillor Sanchez, uh, we wholeheartedly agree that we have to increase our traffic numbers. Uh, when I took over as chief of police, we had two traffic units. Uh, they both worked day shift. Uh, they both uh, worked Monday through Friday. We found that unacceptable. We've expanded their hours. Uh, we have six-day coverage on motors with the deal being that 
they will put a team together on the seventh day for overtime, uh, unfortunately, but we do have seven days coverage. We've also moved one of the squads to swing shift, but our goal is to add that second swing shift squad so we have two day shift squads covering through weekends and two swing shift squads covering through weekends. So thank you, and we are working to move in that direction. And I'll just put in my last comments, uh, uh, Commander and, and Chief. Really appreciate uh, the change of attitude, honestly. I, uh, under the previous chief, had the conversation with him, and he was just not going to do it. He was not going to support it. And uh, for whatever, and had some reason, you know, about uh, uh, constitutionality or something. It was ridiculous. But, but nonetheless, um, I appreciate your taking us on and, and really giving us a lot of attention and time to talk about it and, and hear the comments that we get filtered up through to you and not filtered, I should say, directly to you through us uh, from our constituents. And, uh, uh, you know, it's really made a difference. Uh, it, you know, we can't, uh, we can't declare victory, obviously. We've got to, to keep at it. We've got to keep at it with the enforcement as well, as, as uh, Councilor Sanchez emphasized and, and you reiterated. So, uh, but I want to thank you specifically, Chief, for different, complete different attitude uh, uh, between uh, the two uh, command situations and, and uh, I think we're making some some good progress, and and you know, we, we, what we realize and we talk about a lot is that a lot of these folks are just outlawed. They're out there to raise hell, and that's what it's about. And uh, they could be doing, and most likely are doing, many other illegal things when they're out there doing what they're doing on the streets. Uh, supposedly, you know, it, it's not uh, it's not okay recreation what they're doing. It's dangerous, killing people, innocent people. Um, and it is uh, fomenting, it really, it, the, the activity foments uh, uh, an atmosphere of lawlessness. So um, keep at it, but we really appreciate the work, and I've heard it from a lot of constituents as well, that they can see a difference. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here. All right, we'll move on to general public comments. Uh, we've had some technical difficulties tonight, and I'll ask Mr. Melendres to explain what's been going on, but uh, we had a construction issue here in City Hall, and Chris will explain that, and, and we're, we're gonna try to do our best tonight uh, with some constraints on our, on our uh, interaction with the public. Mr. President, um, due to the construction activities that you referenced, an electrical line was cut to the council chambers on Friday, and it caused an unexpected power outage. There are a lot of systems in place uh, in chambers, um, technological systems related to our ability to, uh, to, to get GovTV out, to have um, different technological capacities in the chamber, one of which is our ability to have our Zoom uh, hybrid meetings, which we've been having for these first few meetings that we've been back in chambers. We were able to get everything back up line, online um, for today's meeting, with the exception of the, the Zoom capability for the hybrid option. We did have uh, about a dozen people sign up um, to speak by Zoom today. And unfortunately, we had to notify them earlier in the day that that was not going to be possible for today's meeting. Um, we did invite them to submit written comments, and we also invited them to come down to the chambers. Um, it was out of our control, unfortunately. Uh, we would have loved to be able to host them remotely, uh, but just couldn't do it for this meeting. Uh, we anticipate that we'll have that fixed for our first meeting in May. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Melendres. Uh, as posted on our website and noted in our published council agenda, this meeting is open to the public and members of the public will be providing comments in person tonight. Members of the public can address the council if they have signed up for public comment per the instructions published on our website Friday. Here are the public comment ground rules. Each participant has up to two minutes to present. Comments are to be addressed to the councilors only through the council president. Any disruptive conduct will re result from uh, removal from the meeting. For those commenting tonight, again, there's a two minute time limit. The light on the podium will be green for the first minute and a half. The light will turn yellow, indicating you have 30 seconds remaining to wrap up your comments. At two minutes, the light will turn red and a bell will ring to indicate that your time is up. Mr. Moya, please call the name of the first speaker. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Don Schrader, followed by Nick Lehman.
I am not vaccinated for COVID. Now, 76, I've never had a flu shot. My dear mother and I both were severely addicted to ice cream, cake, cookies, candy when I was a kid and in my 20s. She ballooned from 98 pounds at 26 to 270 pounds in her 50s. When I saw the hell my mother suffered for many years, I woke up. I changed. I've eaten only healthy, raw foods for 23 years. I know of a man who lost 130 pounds by eating only raw plant food. Cooking destroys most nutrients. I eat no meat, no dairy, no bread, no booze. A worldwide study in 195 nations found there is no safe level of drinking booze. Zero. Booze is slow poison to every cell of our body. No Cokes, no sugar, no sodas of any kind. Sugar feeds cancer. Sugar feeds all infections, including COVID. Sugar is the gateway drug to alcoholism, other drug addiction, diabetes, fat bodies, depression. I weigh 15 to 20 pounds less now than I did 58 years ago in high school when I was eating a lot of crap. <laughs> I walk and exercise much. I get good sleep. I sunbathe most days. I want to live healthy until the day I die. Why suffer? Councillor Davis. Mr. Schrader, uh, I just want to say thank you. Although uh, we've missed you for almost two years now, and I've appreciated your voicemails and your letters, but I have to say it makes me feel like the world's getting back together to know you survived and you're back with us every week now. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for making the effort. Our next speaker is Nick Lehman, followed by Rhiannon and Samuel. Hello, Council and Council President. I'm one of the contributors and editors for ABQ Law. We're a new site that covers Albuquerque news. For the past two years, we've been barred from any access to press releases, emails, and press conferences within the Keller administration and APD. We have constantly requested to be put on the email list. It is important to point out that our readers represent all nine council districts within Albuquerque. The Keller staff and administration have gone out of their way to prevent ABQ Raw from gaining any press access to city government. There have also been times Keller staff members have attacked our readers in the comments section of our stories. We spoke to a mayor spokesman or spokeswoman a few months ago. She was very evasive in why we are not allowed access. She said there's a group of people in the administration who approve the media. We can provide that copy of that phone conversation offline if you're interested. I called the city licensing department and see if uh, media, there's a media license to be had, even called the state. There's nothing that exists. This two-year runaround is going to cost the city money and violates many constitutional rights for working media. Federally, county, and other city government entities around the world recognize this as a local news source. The touting of this administration stating that they are the most transparent is a slap in the face of democracy. The mission of one ABQ is alleged about giving everyone a seat at the table to make our community safer, more innovative, and more inclusive. It should apply to media wanting to report about the city of Albuquerque. We urge the council to hold the Keller administration accountable in giving press access to ABQ Raw, to ABQ Raw and any other media outlet that's requesting it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, sir? There's a question. Mr. President, thank you. I just, uh, Mr. Lehman, thank you for saying something. I know that I have received your email in the past and I had forwarded it on and asked for it to be requested that you be included. So it's, it's sad that that hasn't happened yet, but I'm sure that I will be following up. Thanks. Yes, it goes in the ethers and then we're left on red as the hipsters say. And Councilor Sanchez has a mm -hmm. comment yes. as well. Yes, um, Mr. Lehman, uh, very quickly. Um, I did ask, um, Mr. Rael, 
um, to comment on this, and he is ready with a comment. Mr. President and members of the council, um, first and foremost, um, I will look into this situation and see what, what, is, what is transpiring. However, I will also say to, to all of you that all of the press releases are available and are posted on social media and are available for the public to get access to all of the press releases coming out of the administration. But in this particular situation, we'll look into it and we'll get back with them. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next uh, speaker, please. Uh, Councillor Fiebelkorn. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention, I, I hear Mr. Rael's um, answer, but you know, it is really important that we are um, transparent with all of the media in New Mexico. And um, you know, when we got Mr. Lehman's original email, I reached out to the city council's person who sends out press releases and got them added on, and it was absolutely no problem. So I have no idea why um, the administration would not do the same. Thanks. All right, any other comments? We'll go back to public comment. Thank you, Mr. President. Next speaker is Rhiannon Samuel, followed by Carla Kugler. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. My name is Rhiannon Samuel, and I represent NAIOP, the Commercial Real Estate Development Association for the state. Our members are against mandating project labor agreements in order to do business with the, with the city of Albuquerque. There are countless problems with PLAs, but here are just a few of them. They are inherently unfair to non-union contractors and non-union employees. They discourage competitive build, build, bidding. They increase costs to taxpayers by mandating union wages and work rules that inhibit competition. Mandating project labor agreements disproportionately disadvantage most of our trades workforce by failing to give them equal access to city contracts. NAOP urges the council to override the mayor's veto of E-2260. Thank you. Carla Kugler, followed by Renee Horvath. Mr. President, uh, Council Members Carla Kugler, Associated Builders and Contractors, um, we stand in support of the veto override for the project labor agreement. Um, disappointed that the mayor um, vetoed the will of the council. Again, just we believe that this ordinance creates a disadvantage to non-union contractors. Uh, once again, we do not believe that this is about fair pay or benefits um, or training or following guidelines. Um, we just want to go back to all working together to make sure that projects get done safely and qualified. Um, we do believe that this ultimately will reduce the growth of our local companies. And whatever the decision is tonight, because I know most have made up their minds, um, love to have the conversation to revisit as, as uh, this moves forward to, to see how we can collectively make sure that the local companies are are doing the best that they can in the environment that we've created. So, thank you. Renee Horvath. Mr. President, Ms. Horvath was one of the ones that signed up for Zoom public comments, so she may not be here. So that will conclude uh, general public comments. We'll move on now to the administration question and answer period. Councillors, questions for the administration? Councillor Sanchez and then Councillor Bassan. Thank you. I just had a question in reference to uh, the um, Tingley and Central Corridor. Um, and I'm just curious if there's anything lately that has come up or anything that's been done since this is the third um, city council meeting that we um, talk about this. Mr. President and uh, Councillor Sanchez, um, so the study that we had talked about at the last council meeting is well underway. Uh, we have, um, I've asked the Municipal Development Department to get some, some temporary signs. Um, I know that they are in the process of getting some of those ordered that would, uh, especially as the summer months come into play, 
with increased activity, if you will, at the biopark and at, the, at those intersections of New York and Tingley and to um, just um, signs that would say congested area and uh, asked, uh, we'll ask uh, APD to continue to monitor that corridor, uh, especially on the weekends and the evening hours. Uh, but we're hopeful to get this study done very soon and, and then come back with some real long-term, uh, if you will, um, attempts to fix issues like lighting and other access points uh, so that folks can cross uh, Central and maybe at a, a like I said last week or two weeks ago, you know, using the bike path or some other way to get around that intersection especially. Thank you, Mr. Rao. It would really help if we had some sort of signage that maybe um, directs people to the safe places to cross. I think it's really, really important. I do not want to see with the amount of congestion that's down there right now mm -hmm. on the afternoons and on the weekends anything happen to anyone down there. And so I'd even have to ask APD if they'd even like to, you know, they could be out there a little more often and help out in that area during the busy weekends and an, uh, an evening times. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I don't have a question, but at the last council meeting, it looked like we were going to have a longer agenda. So I didn't want to wait too long to give a shout out to the North Domingo Baca staff and senior affairs. They, on April 1st, hosted a 50 plus senior tech event. And I went to that event and it was really exquisite. I mean, way above and beyond what I experienced. I got a few weird crooked looks because I wasn't really supposed to be there, I suppose, but huh. they were offering so many great avenues to help seniors prevent or, or get fished on the internet, right? And to get scammed. They were providing social security administration information. They had different medical providers there. They gave out a whole bunch of swag and propaganda items, but it was really beneficial and the seniors were super interested and found it very helpful. So uh, to Director Sanchez and the entire team at North Domingo Baca, I think that it was, it was a delight. I think that we definitely need to look into continuing that on again in the future. Any other questions, counselors? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to the journal. Vice President Lewis. Vice President, I move approval of the journal. Second from Councilor Bassan. Uh, all those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? That passes. Uh, we'll move to communications and introductions. Are there any changes to the letter of introduction? Um, I will move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of pulling EC54 out of Finance and Government Operations Committee and placing it on tonight's agenda for action. EC54 is the first amendment of fixed-based operator lease and operating agreement between the City of Albuquerque and Cutter Aviation. This is a suspension of the rules and will need two-thirds vote. As a second from Councillor Davis. Uh, all those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, next is Councillors Bassan, Lewis, and Davis. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Councillors, thank you. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing R29 on tonight's agenda for action. R29 is staying enforcement of the provisions of the alcoholic liquor ordinance that limit the availability of public celebration permits to certain license holders. There's a motion and a second from Councillor Lewis. And uh, we will go to a vote. Again, this will require two thirds vote. All those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll move to myself and Councillor Feeblecorn. Councillor Feeblecorn. Mr. Chair, I move to pull R23 out of the Finance and Government Operations Committee and place it on the May 2nd Council Agenda for Action. R23 is adopting the 2022 Action Plan and Program Investment Summary for the Expenditure of Community Development Block Grants, Home Investment Partnership Program, and the Emergency Solutions Grant Funds. It's providing an appropriation to the Department of Family and Community Services for 2022 U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, Entitlement Funds. Thank you. There's a second for Councillor Davis. We'll go to a vote. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hands. Yes. yes. Opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, Councillor Bassan. Mr. President, I move to pull R26 out of the Committee of the Whole and place it on the May 2nd Council Agenda for Action. R26 is establishing the City of Albuquerque's Automated Speed Enforcement Fund to monitor the speed of travel and enforce the new 
the speed limit through speed enforcement systems, creating a new automated speed enforcement fund 289 in fiscal year 2023. And I'll second that. Um, all those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. yes. Opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll move to, again, Councillor Bassan. Mr. President, I move to pull R21 out of the Finance and Government Operations Committee and refer it to Committee of the Whole. R21 is adjusting fund and program appropriations for operating the government of the City of Albuquerque, appropriating capital funds, and authorizing changes to the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. Appropriations for the purposes of pandemic response, pandemic recovery investments, and support for vulnerable populations. There's a second from Councillor Feeblecorn. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. yes. Opposed? That passes unanimously. Vice President Lewis. I move approval of the letter. There's a second from Councillor Grout. And all those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. yes. Opposed? Mm -hmm. And that passes. We'll move to reports of committees. Councillor Davis. Mr. President, our Finance and Government Operations Committee met on Monday, April 11th and reported out the following items. In the matter of EC36, that, be, that it be approved. In the matter of EC39, that receipt be noted. In the matter of R10, that it be without recommendation. In the matter of R9, R11, and R13, that they do pass. And in the matter of R12, 14, 15, 17, and 19, that they do pass and be acted on at the meeting at which they were reported. I make a motion to accept that report. There's a second from Councillor Grout. Thank you. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. And that passes unanimously. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. The Land Use Planning and Zoning Committee met on Wednesday, April 13th, and reports out the following items. In the matter of O10 and O17, that they do pass as amended. In the matter of R230, that it do pass. I make a motion to accept the committee reports. Second from Councillor Bassan. All those in favor, say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. yes. Opposed? That passes unanimously. Um, we will move to uh, deferrals and withdrawals. Councilors, any deferrals or withdrawals at this time? Okay, I see none. And I'm going to exercise uh, the President's uh, prerogative here and move EC 60, excuse me, which is the Mayor's veto of 0228 up to this uh, point in our agenda. So uh, we have a large contingent of people here. Uh, so that uh, we can get past this and move to other business. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I, I missed the approval of the consent agenda. So before I do that. Mr. Uh, Mr. President, I move approval of the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. You're on top of it. <laughs> There's a motion and a <laughs> second. From Councilor Grout. All those in favor, say yes. Raise your hand. Yes. Thank you. That passes unanimously. Um, so we'll move on now to EC60. This is the mayor's veto of 0228 rescinding enactment of number 21025, council bill number 02180, which required the use of public labor agreements on certain public works construction projects in the city of Albuquerque. Uh, if a councilor wishes to uh, uh, attempt to override the mayor's veto, they will make a, mo a motion to override. If no motion is made, uh, Second is received, but six votes are not obtained in favor of the override motion. The mayor's veto stands. Um, we do have people signed up to speak before we uh, ask for a motion on this, I guess, or, or procedurally, should I go ahead and ask for the motion? Okay, so uh, is there a motion to override? I see Councillor Jones with a second by Councillor Lewis. And so there's a motion and a second on, on the floor. And we will now move to public comment, Mr. Molina. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Rosendro Nahar, followed by Matthew Suarez. Evening, President Benton, Council Members. Uh, first off, I want to thank those of you who did stand with labor last time, and I want to encourage you, uh, City Councilors, to reconsider um, what you're trying to do tonight. And this is truly an investment into our community. The members that are behind me are, are rank and file members who work in this community. These are not slugs. These are hardworking members. This is an investment in our community that we need. The argument that this, this doesn't make it challenging or doesn't make it, it leaves the non-union companies out of the competition is, is nonsense. Our CBA set the prevailing wage. The, the, we set the wages for the work that happens here. Wages, are, there's no difference. They have to follow those rules regardless. This is just an attempt to cover 
the misclassification that happens 100% on ABC NIOP contractors. 100% of the misclassification that happens on construction job sites are on open shop job sites. Take that into consideration. We're talking about speeding and other stuff that we want to get a hold of. Hey, it's bad for our community. It's against the law. 100% of misclassification happened on these job sites and we want to do nothing about it? Two of 11 job sites last year qualified for this PLA. So it's a bad thing to say, hey, 15% of the job sites we're doing, we should invest into our community and make sure they have apprenticeship programs. Make sure we're doing helping out our high school kids who are not graduating or high school kids who are not headed to college. That's a bad idea. Truly, is that what we want to say? Because that's what we're saying at the end of the day, trying to take this PLA away. It's a small investment in back into our communities. It's nonsense what they're trying to say about wages and everything. It's nonsense. They're trying to hire the misclassification that happens on their job sites. And it's a sad thing that we want to sit here and support that stuff. It's a shame. I, I, I can't believe that we're doing that. We're here to represent the city of Albuquerque as a group. Please, as a group, come back together. It's nothing wrong with saying we want to invest into our community. I'm not getting why we're not wanting to say that as a group. It's 15% of the job sites. We're really going to complain about 15% of the job sites? I don't get it. Thank you. I'm going to ask everyone in the audience, please do not applaud. Uh, you know, we, we've got business to conduct. It's not fair to everyone's time if we have applause after every speaker. Matthew Suarez, followed by Courtney Eichhorst. Good evening, Council President Benton, Council members. Uh, my name is Matthew Suarez. I'm representative of the Carpers Union here in New Mexico. I um, stood before you two weeks ago asking you not to repeal this ordinance. We stand uh, against the override of this veto, like our President Rosanna Nahad just said. This is an investment in our community. This is local jobs promoting apprenticeship and training. University of Mexico Hospital did a project labor agreement, the first of its kind, in 2004, brought that project in on time and under budget, proving that project labor agreements work in New Mexico that put people to work. And numerous contractors on that job were non-union open shop contractors. Their members benefited from health care and retirement working on that project for three years. The city owes it to its workers to the workforce and the new people coming into the trades to give them an opportunity to work locally in these projects. Let's invest in New Mexico. Let's invest in Albuquerque. Let's make a promise to our taxpayers and support them. Thank you. Courtney Eichhorst, followed by Tomas Trujillo. Okay. Good evening, President, and good evening, Council members. My name is Courtney Eichhorst. I am the business manager of UA Local 412 Plumbers and Pipe Fitters here in New Mexico, and I am the president for Building Trades Council. Um, it's kind of amazing to think, I'm going to make a few points, but I'm going to start out. What's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different outcome? So let's continue to steal from our workers. Let's continue not to follow prevailing wage laws that are set federally and by the state. Do you guys understand we have state prevailing wage laws that that's law. So if you break a law, you get in trouble, right? You're supposed to. There's federal prevailing wage laws also that if you break those, you're supposed to get in trouble. What a PLA does is it makes sure that these laws are followed. It doesn't matter if you're union or non-union. We just signed the first PLA ordinance, the first job from this ordinance, and there was a lot of non-union contractors that bid the job, guys, a lot. Some really good companies, and we're gonna have a great time working on this project. We're going to have a great time making sure the men and women of Albuquerque on this project get paid correctly and they get to follow the right wages and get the right benefits and do what they're supposed to do to take care of their families. I was raised on union wages. My dad wasn't a union slug. I'm not a union slug. I have worked my butt off since the day I was young to make sure my people are taken care of and they get the right wages and they get the right benefits. So I do take offense being called a union slug. That's one thing I've never even thought of in my life. I know I was trained better than a lot. Um, I've got 300-something apprentices right now in uh, Mr. Davis's district over here, and they're doing a great job. Right now, tonight, there's 200 apprentices, men and women, in class learning how to be pipe fitters, learning how to be plumbers, learning how to be welders. They're the best trained in the state, guys. So what this PLA ordinance is going to do is make us better, stronger, and it's going to make Albuquerque better. So thank you. Appreciate it. Tomas Trujillo, followed by Bobby Baca. Good 
Good evening, good evening, counselors. President Benton, uh, Tomas Hill is not here yet, but I'll, Bobby Baca, I'll speak on behalf of IBW Local 611. We got plenty of our apprentices that came here with us tonight that go to apprenticeship class till 10 o'clock once a week. On a non-union apprenticeship program, the apprentices are only seeing class one night a month. I'm getting, I'm, we're bringing in those apprentices that are concerned that they're not getting the proper education that a structured apprenticeship program does. If they're not working, they're still going to school. On the non-union side, if they're not working, they, draw, they can't go to class. And that's, how, how fair is that? How great is that to build up the workforce when you're just looking for bodies to build a building, right? Some of the apprentices that have come into our program are telling us that there's big time problems on the job with safety, drug abuse, whatever's going on out there. Now, Councillor Sanchez, you know, with all due respect, I choose to forgive you for what you said, but I will never forget, and neither will our membership, will never forget what you said about union workers. That is totally wrong, and I believe you owe a public apology to everybody standing in this room. Now, I've said, all I've said on the last public comment meetings about how PLAs are good, I was a part of the last signing, the first PLA that went into fruition there at the Jane's Corporation, and it was a great community effort. There was cooperation across the board, and I believe that this is gonna be the first of many projects that is gonna build our great city the way project labor agreements are structured to be and the way prevailing wage laws were meant to happen. Now, on behalf of the IBEW and the Joint Apprenticeship and Training Committee, we thank the counselors who stood up strong with working people. We thank you very much. Councillor Pena, Councillor Benton, Councillor Davis, Councillor Fieberkorn, thank you so much. You understand what it truly does mean to be a hardworking labor member and union member building our great city. Thank you. Dan Miano, one more thing, followed please. by. One more thing. And I'll invite the other counselors, please. Sir. I sent you emails inviting you to our Mr. hall and to our program. Mr. Baca, thank you. I would love to see you there. Thank you. Dan Miano, followed by Pete Trujillo. Dan Miano. Pete Trujillo, followed by Cheryl Largo. Cheryl Largo, followed by Matthew Gonzalez. Ms. Largo. Matthew Gonzalez, followed by Vince Alvarado. Good afternoon, counselors. <clears throat> My name is Vince Alvarado, and I am the president of the New Mexico Federation of Labor and the business manager for the Sheet Metal Workers Local 49. I'm a proud third generation construction worker. Thank you all for allowing me, this public provide me comment for today. The last time this body met to discuss this issue, one of the uh, members of this council referred to our union members as slugs. Personal attacks are below all of us, but more importantly, they do not reflect the work done by working class New Mexicans and the service they provide to our community. These working class New Mexicans are in fact union members. When the world was coming down around March of 2020, it was the union brothers and sisters who kept answering the phones in the city to make sure that we had the basic services and who made sure that food was on the shelves at Smith's and Albertson's. There was union members, brothers and sisters who set up additional beds in hallways at University New Mexico Hospital to make sure our families received the medical care for virus that we did not understand. You know, when the world was coming down around us in September, it was union sisters and brothers running into burning, collapsing buildings to secure, to make sure that all occupants were evacuated and rushed to community members to safety to receive medical care. Today's working class New Mexicans make us strong. Today, New Mexico labor unions make us strong. Construction trade workers with a union card have completed intensive apprenticeship programs 
an intensive on-the-job training that you can ensure they know what they're doing. Unions are making sure that companies, businesses, setting roots in New Mexico, like the movie industry, Intel, Facebook, and more, create fair-paying jobs for working-class New Mexicans. The next time you allow one of your council members to call us slugs, remember we built this country with skilled craftsmen and workmen, and when trouble comes, there will be always be here to make sure our community and our nation and our dreams endure. Thank you for your time. Jose Atencio, followed by Robert Albert. Robert Albert. Mr. President, that'll conclude public comments. All right, thank you. Thanks for everyone who spoke. We'll move on now to uh, the council. There's a motion and a second to override the mayor's veto. And again, uh, six votes will be needed to override a veto. Uh, any discussion, counselors? I have a question. I have a comment to make. Councilor Sanchez. I said to make it clear, I didn't call each and every one of you a slug. That's not what my comment was. My comment was that I've been in unions before and I've been in unions that have had slugs that have worked for them. And I also talked about competition, that competition is a good thing. So I don't think the comments here reflect exactly what I said. Thank you. All right, any other comments, counselors? If not, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor of the override, uh, raise your hands and say yes. Opposed? And that fails on a five to four vote. All right, we will, thank you. Uh, please, please, no applause. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're going to move now to the consent agenda. We haven't done consent yet. Did we? Mr. President, uh, you've already voted on the consent agenda. The next item would be announcements and then public hearings. OK. All right, so we're now moving to announcements. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, there will be a committee of the whole meeting on Thursday, April 28th at 5 p.m. in the Vincent E. Griego Chambers. Thank you, Councilor. We'll move to public hearings. And this uh, is AC 224. Brian Langwell appeals to the Landmarks Commission conditions of approval for a certificate of appropriateness. Ms. Julia Colodin will explain this appeal. Thank you, Mr. President. The issue in this appeal is whether a certificate of appropriateness should be approved for a patio shade structure at a building located at 524 Romero Street in Old Town. The Landmarks Commission, the LC, denied the certificate, and the appellant, Ryan Langwell, representing Left Turn Inc. and the tap room at Old Town. Uh, Mr. Could you President, just hang on for just a second, Ms. Gallaudin? Let's get clear the room here. And. Uh, can we close the door, please? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. All right, please start again. Sure. Uh, Mr. President, the issue in this appeal is whether a certificate of appropriateness should be approved for a patio shade structure at a building located in, uh, at 524 Romero Street in Old Town. The Landmarks Commission denied the certificate, and the applicant, Brian Langwell, representing Left Turn Inc. and the tap room at Old Town, appealed the denial. Uh, the council has referred this to its land use hearing officer who recommends that the city council deny the appeal and uphold the Landmarks Commission's decision. Uh, without first obtaining the certificate of appropriateness, the appellant constructed a wrought iron patio shade structure with a semi-lucent plastic greenhouse type material um, and panels on top. Uh, this location is zoned MXT, and the building is a contributing historic building in the HPO5 historic overlay zone for Old Town. 
Um, accordingly, the IDO required that the applicant um, obtain a certificate of appropriateness prior to construction. The Landmarks Commission voted to deny the certificate for the shade structure, finding that the materials used are not in keeping with the historic character of the building or of Old Town overall. And additionally, the placement of the shade structure obscures the view of historic detailing on the building. Um, the appellant disputes the Landmarks Commission's findings. He has stated his intention to place latillas on top of the plastic structure and paint the plastic material. And he claims that the patio shade structure will match the architectural character of Old Town because neighboring buildings also have latilla porch roofs. However, the appellant admits that the historic uh, porch elements are obscured from view uh, by his structure. Belujo found substantial evidence in the record to support the Landmarks Commission's denial of the certificate. He found the patio shade structure with or without latillas on top significantly, significantly obstructs the view of uh, the building's patio detailing, which are uh, fundamental architectural features. Uh, the appellant has not demonstrated that the plastic paneling, whether it's painted or not, is a material that's compatible with Old Town. And simply adding latillas on top of the plastic on the existing structure will not provide matching consistency with patio coverings on neighboring buildings because this patio structure blocks the view, whereas the neighboring latilla porch roofs do not. Um, one thing to note is that although the appellant did not raise this issue in the appeal, the LUHO did note that um, planning staff and the Landmarks Commission incorporated the recently adopted 2022 Old Town Design Guidelines to this application rather than the previous 1998 version um, that were in effect at the time this application was submitted. Um, however, the LUHO analyzed both versions of those guidelines and found that the appellant failed to satisfy either version, uh, so this was a harmless error. The LUHO concluded that regardless of which version of the design guidelines apply, the Landmarks Commission's decision is supported by substantial evidence, and so the appeal should be denied. Um, one other thing to note is that the Landmarks Commission and planning staff have advised the appellant that if he reconstructs the shade structure with appropriate materials and in a way that does not obstruct uh, the view of the patio detail, an extended patio covering could be approved. Um, and this is an accept or reject proceeding, so council's options are to accept the LUHO recommendations and findings, accept the recommendations or adopt different findings, or it can uh, uh, reject the LUHO's recommendation in which case this matter would be scheduled for a full hearing before the council at our next meeting. I'm gonna call on Councilor Bassan in just a second, but I do need to read a uh, disclosure uh, uh, statement uh, on my own behalf. Prior to the Landmarks Commission review of this application, I was contacted by co constituents regarding the modifications made to this building. I referred the constituents to the planning department and had no further contact or involvement. I believe I can be impartial in considering the matter before us tonight. Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I would like to make a motion to uphold the LUHO findings and recommendations. There's a motion second. and a second from Councilor Feeblecorn. Uh, any further discussion, Councilors? Seeing none, all those in favor uh, of accepting the LUHO's recommendation and findings, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Yes. Opposed? And that passes unanimously. All right, we'll move on to final actions. Um, the first item is item A, 02215, repealing the Neighborhood Association Recognition Ordinance, section 1482, and replacing it with a revised Neighborhood Association Recognition Ordinance, and prescribing responsibilities and services offered by the Office of Neighborhood Coordination and making revisions to the integrated development ordinance related to neighborhood association notice. I move it do pass. There's a motion and a second from Councillor Davis. And uh, we'll move to, we had to have some people signed up to speak, but we'll move to the staff summary. And uh, uh, I know that uh, Ms. Morris worked uh, uh, quite a bit on this and de deserves uh, credit for all the work over the years really. Uh, but Mr. Melendres is very uh, up to speed on it and was also a participant in um, the development of the ordinance. So, uh, Mr. Melendres. Sure, thank you, Mr. President. Um, the proposed revisions before you address the current um, city's neighborhood, city's current neighborhood recognition ordinance 
It was first adopted in 1987 and has not undergone significant revision since then. There's been several uh, sort of one-off amendments through the years, um, but this proposal is a repeal and replacement, which uh, signifies a pretty significant overhaul of the ordinance. Um, since its inception, the ordinance contemplated this concept of recognized neighborhood associations. It would be provided um, with special treatment by the city in the form of notice about land use appeals, land use matters coming through the planning department, and with the formula formulation of the IDO, they are also conferred um, standing in land use appeals. Um, over the years, other types of organizations developed within the community that didn't really fit within the structure of the original narrow, including um, neighborhood coalitions, um, which are prevalent in doing work in the community, homeowners associations, business groups, and none of them ever really had a place that fit in to the neighborhood association recognition ordinance. So this, one of the main features of this update is to sort of clean up um, some of those uh, historic discrepancies that have kind of developed over time and that don't really have a place within the narrow. Um, and specifically, the narrow proposes that two types of associations would be eligible for recognition. One would be neighborhood, recognized neighborhood associations that meet certain requirements for holding open and democratic meetings and making sure that members are involved. Um, the other would be a recognized neighborhood coalition, which are, could generally be a, a larger group that is a conglomeration of various associations and potentially individuals. Um, and in exchange for the benefits that the city would confer, including um, heightened notice as compared to the general public, and also the, the ability to enter an appearance in a land use matter without necessarily having to demonstrate standing on an individualized basis, those associations would be asked to sign up uh, for the open democratic uh, process components that are specifically outlined within the ordinance. Um, they'd be asked to hold an annual meeting and provide notice um, to, to members and to the community so that people could be involved uh, to evaluate their bylaws from time to time and do any updates that might be necessary to hold an annual meeting um, so that uh, folks will have an opportunity at least once per year to show up and participate. It also outlines the duties of the Office of Neighborhood Coordination with more specificity um, with respect to what duties it would have for the community um, and give some guidance as well for other city departments and what their obligations might be to the city's neighborhood associations. Um, I think that's the general gist of the proposal that's before you. If you have any questions, staff is available to help with those and we will stand by. Thank you. Comments, uh, Councillor Bassan. Mr. President, thank you. Uh, well, th this was such a big deal uh, last year when we, when we reviewed it and we discussed it and it didn't go through committee this time. It seems from public comment and from what I've noticed in, when it was introduced that it's very rapid being that we have Zoom difficulties tonight and there's a lot of comment that comes in via email and this is literally regarding the neighborhood associations that make up Albuquerque, I would like to move a deferral until the next council meeting so that other people have the opportunity to weigh in and that we can also have some more time to evaluate what, what this is being that it was, it was quite rapid. Second. There's a motion and a second from Councillor Grout on a deferral. Uh, any discussion on the deferral? Uh, I'll, I'll say something about it. Um, to me, uh, the extensive process, extensive process leading up to fall of last year when uh, the, uh, the vote was taken by the council to, uh, to not uh, proceed at that time on a four to, four to five vote, uh, it, it uh, was defeated at that time. But an extensive process of starting in 2017 and going all up through the committee process, uh, it was my opinion that it did not need to be rehashed all over again. We've done that uh, just recently on another bill that it took a whole lot of air out of the room. So what I did was go exactly from where we were leading up to that. We, we had a, a lengthy meeting and a lengthy discussion in the previous council leading up to uh, the uh, defeat of, of the bill. Uh, and with numerous, with, with about an hour and a half work, if I can recall correctly, of numerous amendments made by many of the people who ended up voting against it. Uh, and every single one of those am amendments, with the exception of one, is still in this bill. So it's being picked up just as it was with a different council. And uh, how much more uh, of 
hearing the same arguments that we heard against it last time, many of which were inaccurate, you know, is uh, something I just can't go through again. So I cannot support the, uh, the deferral. I'd like to make a comment. Sir, uh, Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, although I, I appreciate the thousands of hours that were actually spent on this, but um, as I talk to all my neighborhood organizations, and I don't really even recall even one in my district that actually supports any part of this. So to me, it's concerning that I have a whole entire district that I'm saying 100% don't want it. So I'm coming in on this with the last council doing all the work. And we're a new council now, and I'm still trying to get a feel for exactly what we're doing here and um, in reference to this. And the only measuring stick that I have is that 100% of my neighborhood organizations do not want anything to do with it. And so I think it's important that we do defer and we have some more discussions with people out in the community, specifically the neighborhood organizations, because they're the ones that are actually supporting us as counselors and making sure that we do the right decisions, make the right decisions. And like I said, I don't think I even have one neighborhood organization who, who, who likes it. So I would go with the deferral as well. have the motion for deferral in a second but we do have people signed up to speak so I think that's the next step and then we'll vote on the deferral so uh, Mr. Moya thank you Mr. President Our first speaker will be Miss Ward followed by Nita Day President Vinson and counselors it was very disappointing to learn that the previously defeated rewriting of the NARO reappeared. There was no notice given to neighborhood associations, homeowners associations, or coalitions who would be directly affected by this resurrected legislation. If the legal issues with the DRB have taught this council anything, I hope it is that it should not move blithely ahead with sweeping ordinance changes that tread upon constitutional rights. Further, I remind you that the previous council was presented or presented was presented demonstrably erroneous information prepared by city staff in support of this legislation. Please vote no on this ordinance. Thank you. Nita Day, followed by Renee Horvath. Good afternoon, President Benton, members of the council. Thank you for being here tonight. So I would ask that you vote no on this legislation for multiple reasons. I sent you a lengthy email. I even sent you a red line of this ordinance with changes that even neighborhoods would like to see, uh, I believe, from our past discussions of when this ordinance came before this council again. In civil law, as an attorney, even though I don't represent anyone, and I am just testifying here today as a member, we would call this raised judicata. We've already been down this road as neighborhood associations. We ask you to please not waste taxpayers' money to go through this and redo it all over once again, unless you're going to make this a collaborative process that utilizes and engages neighborhoods in the process. The, the neighborhood engagement process, we already heard at the last, uh, um, when this ordinance was proposed uh, previously, we heard multiple testimonies from neighborhoods saying, we were not part of that neighborhood engagement process. I cited to you a statistic that almost 62% of the neighborhood associations out there were not engaged. My own neighborhood association did participate However, only three board members 
could participate. You can't tell me that just three members is enough input for you to rewrite a statute. So if you want to collaboratively, be, collaboratively engage neighborhood associations, come to their annual meetings. That's where these meetings, where you can get good feedback and really help get some strong, informative information to rewrite a good NARO statute that really represents the will of the people. So I'd ask you as my counselors here tonight to please vote this down if it comes before you. I wouldn't even accept an, a, a deferral. And if you do, make it for 90 days, please. Thank you. Renee, Any questions? Renee Horvath, followed by Michael Brasher. Michael Brasher, followed by Joe Damon. Mr. President, looks like that'll conclude public comments. All right, we're back on the deferral. Uh, yes, Councilor Bassan. My apologies, Mr. President. It's been brought to my attention that the deferral that I asked for is going to line this up with the IDO hearings that we have. So I would like. <laughs> yes, I, I would actually like to not do that. Um, how long do we do we anticipate two meetings for IDO? Mr. President and Councilor Brisson, um, it's the discretion of the council how much time you take with that. Uh, historically, with IDO annual, annual updates, they have not been acted upon at the same meeting they hit council. So I think just if the past is any predictor of the future, we can anticipate at least one one deferral before final action on that. Okay, Mr. President, I'm going to uh, make a motion or change my motion, please, to. Gosh, okay, I'm gonna try for May 16th. I'm happy to go out further, but if we can just at least try for May 16th, um, that way we can try to hear from some of the public. Again, I believe this is super important that some of the public, on one hand, we hear we've talked to, and then the other hand, I get a lot of comments that we haven't heard from or involved them. So I would like to change my motion to May 16th. There's a motion and a second for the uh Revised motion, uh, second by Councillor Grout. Any further discussion? All right, then we'll go. This is the vote to defer to May uh, 16th. Yeah. All right, those in favor, uh, raise your hand and say yes. Opposed? And that fails on a four to five vote. We're back on the bill as presented. And um, any discussion, counselors, questions? Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I, so in the staff write-up, it lists all of the endless hours and lots of effort that was put into this, and I completely respect that. However, again, I think it's very important to recognize that I agree with Councilor Sanchez that so far, every neighborhood association in my district has been opposed to this as it is written, and it's not in my opinion, good representation for me to just go and vote for something that I have not heard anything positive about, or if we have heard some positive comments, they're very minimal and they're asking for more time. Uh, therefore, in order to make sure that I feel like I'm really representing my district based off of what they're asking for, I am not in support of this at this time. I have Cal Councilor uh, Grout, and then- uh, Mr. Councilor President, Sanchez. I have to say the same thing that uh, Councilor Brisson has said. Every one of the emails that I have received from constituents in my district have all said um, to defer, um, let's talk about it. They didn't know it was coming up. And while I respect the time that you all have put into it, I have to um, listen to what the constituents are saying as well until we have more information. Uh, yes, Councilor Jones and then uh, Councilor Sanchez, do you want to speak again? Thank you, Mr. President. It's my understanding, having lived with this IDO and everything for way too many years, that in fact this is set up to be uh, readdressed on a two-year basis. Is that right, Mr. Melendres? Um, Mr. President and Councilor Jones, you, you would have the ability to reassess this at your discretion at any time. Yes. Okay. I thought it was automatically at two years, but it could obviously, if this passes, uh, it could obviously, or if it doesn't pass, it could be addressed again at our discretion. 
Mr. President, Councilor Jones, that's correct. Thank you. Therefore, I will be supporting this action because I think we have some glitches in the existing legislation that this helps fix, and I don't think it does any harm, but I believe what we have in place uh, isn't quite co isn't correct. So I think it would be much better to go ahead and try this. It will cause no harm. We can override it at our discretion if need be, and um, get it moving forward as opposed to one more time, deferring, stalling, deferring to stalling. Uh, let's get it, let's get move forward with it. So I will not support a deferral. All right, so um, uh, we're past the deferral at this point and we're back on the bill. Um, there are two amendments and uh, I'd like to move those amendments. These are, one is strictly a, a cleanup uh, amendment, but we'll uh, have Mr. Melendros describe uh, the two amendments, uh, well, one at a time, I suppose. Sure, Mr. President, if, if you'd like to move the uh, cleanup yep. amendment as Amendment 1. To my All right, this would be floor amendment number 1 to 022-15, uh, and uh, we have that up on the screen for the public. Mr. President, um, this amendment essentially, is, as you mentioned, is a cleanup amendment. It clarifies some terms, uh, distinctions uh, between business coalitions and business groups and community organizations. Some of those terms were used interchangeably when we meant one thing in the draft, and so this cleans that up. In addition, it clarifies uh, some voting options for neighborhood associations, um, and that's, that's essentially it, the, the cleanup of the coalition business group language and the clarification of the voting options. All right, so this is really just uh, some terminology making it consistent throughout the bill. Uh, any discussion on amendment, floor amendment number one? I'll, I'll move floor amendment number one. A second from Councillor Jones. Uh, seeing none, all those in favor of floor amendment number one, raise your hands and say yes, yes. Opposed? And that passes. Then we'll move on to floor amendment number two. <clears throat> Second. Floor amendment number two, I'll move, uh, uh, move that and uh, ask Mr. Melendres to explain this Mr. one. As a little Mr. Bit President, as, as you mentioned, um, when this bill was before council uh, late last year, there were a number, of, a number of amendments that occurred at that time, um, one of which completely changed the concept as it applies, as the ordinance would apply to neighborhood coalitions. Um, it went to a concept where instead of having a geographic boundary for coalitions uh, that identified their membership, uh, the coalition would simply list their membership and there'd be a rule that um, you couldn't be a member of more than one coalition. That presents some logistical problems for the planning department relative to their ability to do notice and, and to just sort of administer things uh, related to land use matters coming through the IDO. And so this would uh, put coalitions back within the column of having to have an identifiable geography, which is essentially the way the coalitions exist now. It wouldn't affect um, uh, neighborhood associations. All right, any discussion or questions on the amendment? Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, do we have coalitions right now that reside in more than one district, aside from the inner coalition? Yes. Okay, I, thank you, I didn't know. I think the West Side actually has two coalitions, but one of them goes across multiple council districts. Uh, any other questions? So yeah, this really, it, it again, goes back to the bill the morning of the day it passed, and this was a kind of a late coming amendment that, uh, that we did pass at that time. Uh, it's the only one that we did not incorporate in the, in the bill this year. So. Uh, all those in favor say yes, raise your hands. Yes. Opposed, and that passes. Um, we're back on the bill as amended. Um, I just wanted to, to respond to Ms. Day's statement um, about utilizing the neighborhood associations in the process. And I would say that that was the primary imperative of what we did starting in 2017. We directly contacted 222 neighborhood associations, contacted and recontacted. When I say we, this was uh, 
we engaged a very uh, highly qualified um, uh, out, outside contractor to conduct that process and because we knew it was going to require repeated recontact and contact and a lot of close contact with the people who chose the neighborhood groups who chose to participate out of that 222 about 97 chose to participate uh, this was a workshop type process you know with a lengthy uh, lengthy questionnaire and back and forth discussions with those who chose to uh, participate uh, Ms. Day said that 62% that never engaged. Well, that was not through lack of our attempts to engage them. Um, and she said in her own neighborhood that three members of, of the neighborhood participated, but what we needed to do was to go to, to every neighborhood, every 222 neighborhood meetings and somehow hash it out at a neighborhood annual meeting. Well, that wasn't practical. What, had, what we needed were participants, and three is plenty for many neighborhoods, to participate in the process and go back and forth with their neighborhood when they have their meetings, uh, say what they like or don't like about, about the, 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 uh, the way the um, neighborhood engagement and, and participation works, and work with us on it. So if people chose not to work, work with us on it, having a, a you know, numerous, um, well, I don't know, large meetings or small meetings where we're trying to just go in with a group um, that have other things on their agenda, et cetera, and try to work and get positive feedback as opposed to thoughtful feedback from the people who really wanted to read the questionnaires and think about what the issues are in their own neighborhood. And um, I will say for one that I haven't had one neighborhood in my district complain about it. So I don't know where all these folks are coming from or what their problem is, but uh, whatever. I, I, didn't, I didn't have anybody. <laughs> from District 2 say anything about it other than uh, some positive comments. And I did work with the coalition in, in my, in my uh, district. I worked, we worked with the coalition. And I think the point was it made that, that this, um, or what Mr. Melendres made the point, but just to reiterate it, uh, this greatly clarifies the standing of coalitions, which didn't really exist before. It, it was sort of offhandedly included as a participant um, in the past, but did not have standing. Then in the IDO, it gained a form of standing, but I think what we did was really uh, iron that in for the coalitions as well. So the only, uh, the only things that were done primarily were just to ask for some basic outreach on the part of the Neighborhood Association and ask for a very basic democratic process within those associations. And I, mea culpa, if you don't like the fact that we're saying that you should uh, have to not have to pay dues to be a member of an association, I respectively object. We don't do that in voting in this country. We don't make people pay to vote or to have their voice heard in a democratically run organization. So um, it doesn't mean you can't charge dues. It just means that a person can't be required to pay dues in order to vote or participate. So there was a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, Ms. Day was claiming there was, mis and I believe someone else was claiming that there was misinformation on other sides. Well, there was plenty of mis misinformation that goes on in any debate, uh, especially when people are, are, uh, are passionate about, about uh, their neighborhood association. And I come from that myself. And I know some other counselors here do, did too, where we were neighborhood association presidents ourselves. And we did the shoe leather. We went out and put leaflets on the doors uh, and tried as hard as we could to get every single person in that neighborhood, and business for that matter. Businesses are supposed to be invited to neighborhood associations. Oftentimes they're not. Uh, uh, to try to, come, try to come on down, join us, you know, and, and have the discussions and say what's wrong with the neighborhood and what you want to fix and, and be a voice with the, with the city. Um, but it's hard to do that when people don't reach out and engage. And it's even harder to do it when uh, people are requiring dues for, for participation. And I've seen that in, in my district. And uh, I've seen some of these problems where neighborhoods were trying to expand their, their boundaries into other neighborhoods' areas. I mean, it, it was havoc. It was a bad situation. So this really, I think, was, is a step forward 
and is really empowering neighborhood associations. To the contrary, is not taking anything away. So I, I urge your support. So, uh, Councilor, uh, okay. Um, Mr. Melendez, I had a few amendments last time that we were working on this, and I don't know, um, I, I apologize, I didn't get them ready for this. I had, was looking for them, and Rachel found them for me today, so I was wondering if we could look at adding those to, um, well, vote on them. Um, Mr. President, Councilor Pena, uh, staff does not have copies of those. I don't know if uh, they weren't provided to staff in advance of the meeting. Um, let me ask, uh, are they amendments subsequent to the final action on the bill last time? I guess I just want to point that out to make sure that the council is all of the same understanding that, that this bill, as introduced, incorporates the very last version um, that was on the table for the council late last year and includes all the amendments that uh, so were made up to that point. That was the next part of my question. So I wasn't sure if these amendments were incorporated into it or not. Um, Mr. President, so if, if Councilor Pena, if, if they were amendments that you moved and had approved in, mm -hmm. the, in the bill that was on the table last year, then they are included in this bill. I don't recall if they were or weren't. weren't. So is there any way that we can table this for a second so I can have you look over those amend these amendments? I have a copy in front of me, and then we can go from there. Mr. President, Council Pena, it's the dis discretion of the council um, if you'd like to take that time for staff to do that evaluation. Uh, and, and if you do, then it would require a motion to table. So the few of the amendments that I have or had, and I hate to discuss them if they're already incorporated into the bill, um, I was trying to look, but I couldn't pull it up, so I couldn't find the actual um, legislation. But one of them is the additional recitals that were intended to provide greater community-based context to the administration of the, the NARO. Um, the last recital also offers a basis of recognizing coalitions um, as is being proposed. So um, this one is just a really a list of um, whereas is, I think, even in our original NARO. Um, it didn't list why neighborhood associations were even organized. It wasn't because um, cities decided that they wanted to recognize neighborhood associations and get input, but it was actually an, an action from the federal government. I think a president, I don't have that information in, in front of me, is that it really was to bridge a gap between communities and the developer because of um, what some of the atrocities that were happening in some neighborhoods um, um, back in the day in terms of a developer coming in and, and you know, doing what they were and the voices in the community didn't have a, have a say. So it looks like you want to add. So were they, was that incorporated? Mr. President, Councilor Pena, I recall those uh, recitals that you're referencing. I think I helped you draft those. And they are in this bill. Uh, they begin okay. on page 2, line 20. Okay, perfect. Perfect. And then the other one is... Um, Kind of the developer responsibilities, the developers and persons engaging recognized neighborhood associations, coalitions to development proposals shall act with, with diligence and good faith in coordinating um, with neighborhood members and representatives. It is a responsibility of all persons in the development project, including those um, pursuing um, development projects to promote collaboration and listening with respect to neighborhood concerns because this is kind of taken out, and this is really, um, for me, this is kind of the crest of it, crux of it. It actually um, is just, there's not really something, a process that they have to follow, but the developers really have to try to engage with communities, hence why um, the uh, neighborhood rec recognitions were actually even created. Mr. President, Councilor Pena, I recall those as well, and those are in the bill that's before you. Okay. Those are on page 13, line 4. Okay, I apologize um, once again. And then the last one was the responsibilities of the ONC. Mr. President, Councilor Pena, uh, the responsibilities of the ONC section, it begins on page 12, line 18. And uh, in my blue line copy that I have just my staff notes on, um, I see that those are our, the, the amendments that you proposed in the last bill are included here as well. They're included. Okay, great. Well, thanks to the counselors who were here and voted on them. <laughs> so thank you for, for indulging me. Thank you, okay. Counselor. I have a comment. Uh, Counselor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Um, as we're sitting here today, all the speakers are actually in District 1. And uh, I very much appreciate you coming forward and uh, giving your input in reference to um, what is what we're looking at. As I said before, 100% of uh, District 1's neighborhood associations have have expressed to me that they don't want it. I'm going to be voting against it. Um, however, um, I don't know how the votes are going to go. And I think it's really important that if this does pass, that I think it's important that we actually put some sort of training together so that all of the neighborhood organizations will understand what's going on. And then at that point, they can give feedback to whoever the trainer would be, possibly. And uh, at that point, maybe we can find um, a little more even ground. Um, I ask that if the training does go on and if there are some issues, I'd definitely like to bring it back to the council to make sure that we are addressing any of the issues um, that we might need since it's at our discretion to bring that back down. And um, I will be one of the ones that will do that if, uh, if we need to. Well, our, our very capable Vanessa is here. I don't know if she wants to comment on that, but she is very good with, with the, uh, working with the neighborhoods. And um, in fact, Ms. Schultz, who could not be here, uh, Councillor Sanchez did mention to me that that concern, and I apologize, I should have mentioned it earlier, but uh, I wholeheartedly support that. I'm sure mm -hmm. Vanessa will as well. Um, that as we go forward that that we help in every way possible including and and Vanessa it does go to the meeting regularly um, and is uh, an open line to, you know 40 hours a week or more <laughs> um, for the neighborhoods uh, to, to help guide them with this so I think we we uh, I will wholeheartedly support the idea of a uh, uh, you know kind of an outreach and, and help training process I guess if you will on on the new ordinance Council President Benton, councilors, yes, absolutely, wholeheartedly. Um, you know, we're a little short-staffed right now, so I think having somebody who could help us with that would be ideal. It would, it would be very helpful to be able to go out to work with the neighborhoods more extensively than I feel that we already do. I understand there has been you know, a lot of confusion and, and mis misinformation about the ordinance, and I would welcome the opportunity to work much more closely with our neighborhoods going forward and our coalitions to, you know, to answer their questions and try and ease their minds. I know there has been some concern. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. And Vanessa, thank you. And I, I have to say to the people who are watching this or the people who have a concern about all of this, we, the city staff um, in Vanessa's department know this thing inside and out. They have it memorized and they are always willing to help. I, I have no problem reaching out to them when I don't understand what it says or if it's still in there. So. Just be assured that we have some wonderful people who work this thing and understand what's going on, and they are always available to all of our citizens. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, C Vanessa. Councilor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Ms. Baca, thanks for being here. Uh, you're going to be in the spotlight for a second, I guess, now, since you're here. Um, I want to say first, Mr. President, I appreciate the work that's gone into this as well. It, it's, we've been through this and, and watched you in particular take a leadership role in this, and I appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate Councilor uh, Pena's uh, amendments that were added from last year about the history of the importance, because it is important that we define what is the purpose, because when we're having a fight about is this the fight for the neighborhood, how should, the, how should we weigh those interests, um, it's important to remember what they're supposed to be for and to help keep folks on the path to being successful advocates for their community. Um, one of the <laughs> things that I'm really excited about, um, as Councilor Jones said, tweaking things a little bit, um, this is a good first step. It's a big first step, but it's, a, it's one that we can continue to work on. I like the fact that there are additional people that can get these notifications, not just one officer or one designee of an entire neighborhood, which can be five, 6,000 households in some cases, uh, because there could be more than one. We've seen and all heard complaints from folks that said, well, I didn't get the neighborhood notice about the liquor license or the zoning issue because the person who receives the emails didn't think it was important, but it was important to me. And I think that's important. I also agree wholeheartedly. Um, I think businesses are a piece of this, uh, are, are pieces of our neighborhoods, nonprofits are, as are our residents, and they should all be uh, treated equally and have the opportunity to participate um, in different places in our city. Different neighborhoods have different rules for who gets to vote and who gets to be a member. Um, and I also think it's incredibly important that we don't require dues as a precondition. Um, there are neighborhoods in our city where 
we're struggling to increase participation in city government more, and we're trying to reduce fees and fines and everything else to encourage people to participate with us. Um, and asking somebody to pay 50 or or $100 a year to participate in a public meeting to have their voice heard um, is simply unconscionable today as we understand that role. Ms. Fock, I have a point, I promise. Um, of all that, you do lots of notices, but I wanna ask you and perhaps the administration to help during the budget cycle. A couple of years ago, we passed, I think it was a budget goal um, that asked the departments to come up with a way to allow individuals to sign up for notices outside of the standard recognition. Um, at one point, that rec notice process was literally a copy-paste from an Excel spreadsheet or a list of designated folks. But I understand that the planning department's process for e-reviews and stuff may allow some of that. Um, and so I'd like to encourage this council, if we pass this forward tonight, or even if we don't, to look at resourcing that to ensure that in, in individuals who aren't represented by a neighborhood association or who may take a counter position from their neighborhood association have the equal right to engage with us and know what's going on. Um, Ms. Baca, I don't know if you have any information on that or if the administration can tell us more about their plans, but I do think it's an item we ought to discuss at the budget uh, to increase participation. That was kind of long winded. Council Ms. President Baca. Benton, Councilor Davis, I do know the planning department is working on a opt-in notification system. I don't know the specifics of where they are. I know back in, um, I believe it was August, September, when the revised NARO did come before council, I know that there had been some technical difficulties on the back end with getting it going. I unfortunately don't know where it stands now, but I do know that that has been a work in progress. And Mr. President, Ms. Baca, we don't need to delay this conversation this evening, but I'd love to follow up with Director Varela and the administration on that process for that. I think if we pass this and can start off on the right foot, where everybody can be on the same place, that would be a big step forward and help your job and help your staff be more successful. Thank you. Mr. President, I'm sorry. I, uh, uh, on behalf of council staff, I just want to add that the, to the best of our information, the AGIS system has a, a mapping tool in place that uh, is about to go live in about a month um, that will allow people to identify all the land use issues that are going on around them so that they can kind of see what that is for themselves. And I, I, I wanted to point out, and I appreciate you bringing up and reminding me, uh, Councilor Davis, um, we have the opportunity with our budget to talk with Ms. Baca, and I'll just put it out there right now, let's talk about what the cost of a robust uh, training system would be and, and uh, work on that through the uh, budget process. Any other discussion? Thanks, Ms. Baca. Thanks for all you do. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Rao. Mr. President, I was just going to say that uh, Ms. Baca is going to be uh, representing the city administration on this presentation so she can get everything she needs for the entire city. Uh, very good. Very good. Thank you. All right. Well, seeing no other discussion, we have a motion and a second and uh, on the bill as amended. And so we'll go to a vote. All those in favor say yes and raise your hands. Yes. yes. Opposed? And that passes on a five to four vote. So we'll move on to next is M3. This is uh, Councillor Grout. Mr. President, thank you. Um, this is for a memorial to um, urging the United States Senate to hear the nomination for the United States Attorney for the District of New Mexico. And I move a due pass. There's a motion and a second from Councillor Lewis. Um, sir, uh, the District of New Mexico is currently without a U.S. Attorney. Back in January, the Council asked the administration in R22-1 to assess reopening and renegotiating the city's court-appointed settlement agreement with the U.S. De uh, Department of Justice. But we need a U.S. attorney for New Mexico to make that happen. President Biden submitted a nominee to the State Judiciary Committee, but a hearing on the nomination hasn't been scheduled yet. This memorial isn't intended to endorse any candidate for the job. It simply asks the Senate to hold hearings and get a U.S. attorney appointed for the District of New Mexico, and I urge your support. Thank you, Councilor Grout, for this uh, uh, memorial. Any other discussion? 
seeing, uh, seeing not, uh, Council Lewis. This is why I seconded the bill, but I'm not going to support it. I, I uh, and I, I do appreciate um, Council Grau for bringing this forward, and, and I think it's really out of a sincere desire to make to help our our, our federal delegation to um, to come alongside um, of us and and ensure that um, we're communicating to the Attorney General as well as to the DOJ and do what they can do to, to come alongside us and help us. Um, but I'm not sure if it's required, if this is specifically required in order to do that. I think it was a request from uh, from the uh, their staff, um, but I, I don't believe um, having these hearings is um, a, uh, a requirement for them to, again, come alongside us and help us uh, with the challenges and, and the dis consent decree and, and what we're dealing with. And so, and I also don't, I, 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 I think in some ways this would be a, an endorsement of this candidate and I, I don't know enough about this candidate to be able to, to make that kind of a statement. In fact, um, um, I'm not sure I would. And also, I mean, for, for us to be telling the U.S. Senate uh, for, you know, whatever um, issues that they're dealing with that are keeping these nominations from happening or confirm confirmations from happening right now. Um, is an entirely different, um, I think, issue at, at hand as well. So, um, so that, that's why I don't support the memorial. Again, I understand the sponsor's um, intention, though, and desire, and I, I think that we have the same desire, and that is that our federal delegation would come alongside of us and help us. All right, Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, I think I'm clear, but I'd like to be really crystal clear. Uh, this is not an endorsement from what you said. This is essentially saying we want our congressional delegation to do everything in their power to get up and handle it. That's the nicest way I could I could possibly come up with. There's another term I really wanted to say, but to to handle appointing somebody to U.S. or to a U.S. attorney here in New Mexico, so that we can actually move forward and even start the process of renegotiating potentially the CASA with the DOJ and all of that. Because right now we're on a complete hold. Yep. Until at least that happens, correct? Yep. Thank you, Councillor Lewis. Uh, I do. I do not think that is correct. I, I don't believe we're on a complete hold at all uh, for the for our federal delegation to come alongside us and help us in that regard, as far as reforms to the consent decree. So, but I also understand that this was a request from our federal delegation, mm -hmm. and if by passing this, then uh, then they will do that, then that'd be great. You know, if, they, if this is what it takes is for, if they request the city, uh, the city council of Albuquerque to pass this, and if by doing that they're saying, yes, we are going to now come alongside of you and help you with reforming uh, the consent degree and actually um, encouraging the, uh, um, the DOJ to implement the guidelines, uh, suggested guidelines that Merrick Garland put in place last fall. Um, if that's what our federal delegation is saying, if, if uh, Senator Lujan and Senator Heinrich are saying to do this and then we will help you with that, uh, then maybe there's some good things that could come out of this. But, um, uh, but I don't believe that, that specifically by doing this is the key or the trigger um, to allowing all that to happen. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and put my two cents worth in. I mean, I, I do believe that... Um, Having gone through the, the entire lead up to the DOJ intervention, of which uh, some of us uh, voted on that one, I think. Um, uh, at that time, uh, I attended multiple meetings in the office here in Albuquerque. And having a US attorney uh, for New Mexico was a pretty important part of those discussions. And to have a vacancy is, I think, a pretty important deficit in those discussions. Uh, now, I know there's a lot of partisan stuff, to use the nice word, going on in Washington. Um, I don't think that's the point. I think we need a, a U.S. attorney for the state of New Mexico, and we're at the elected body of, of, of the city of Albuquerque, and that's a pretty big piece of the state of New Mexico, and we have this consent decree that, that we're dealing with. So uh, I strongly support this memorial, and I, I hope it's heard. Mr. President. Councilor, Councilor Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, too, wrote a letter to our congressional delegation asking for any type of help and support in reference to um, putting forth at least the actions that, uh, that are in place now with all of the other um, cities who are having to deal with this now. And um, I think it's really important that 
we try and do anything and everything that we can to get the attention of not only our federal delegation, but anybody, all of our constituents, all of our friends, all of our family members that live in the biggest city in New Mexico to do anything and everything that we can to make sure that we can reach out and show that we do have a crisis in Albuquerque. And, and every little thing matters, in my opinion. Every little, every little move that we move forward is something. And so I think it's, I think it's a good thing um, when I talk to, um, when I talk to um, Mr. Heinrich's uh, secretary, she actually advised the same thing in reference to Councilor Grout. So I think as the elected body in uh, Albuquerque, the biggest city in New Mexico, I think it's really important that uh, we actually make sure that uh, when our new, um, when our newly appointed um, U.S. attorney is here in town, that each and every one of us sit with him and let him know our concerns and hold him accountable as well for, to help us, to help us get through this. Well, we are going to close her. Uh, Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Mr. President. So um, the, the, the resolution that we passed um, was part of asking our federal delegation to, to help us um, with what we saw as some concerns about the consent degree and the relationship that we have with the DOJ and asking for you know, help with uh, those, those guidelines from Merrick Garland. And, uh, and rather than uh, making, um, I guess, any other kind of response that would help us or say, yeah, we're going to talk to Merrick Garland about it, we're going to you know, send some letters like another uh, congressional member did uh, from New Mexico, um, our, our Lujan and, or Senator Lujan and Senator Heinrich have said, um, hey, um, uh, tell the U.S. Senate to pass our, uh, to confirm our uh, Joe Biden's pick for uh, U.S. US uh, attorney. So um, if that's what it takes for, um, for our delegation, I guess, to get involved in this and help us, then I guess it sounds like we're going to do that tonight. So we'll make that statement. Councilor Davis. Yeah, Councilor Lewis beat me to it. I, <clears throat> it's odd for me to hear some of our, my colleagues um, encouraging the Senate to support President Biden's nominees. But I just want to make something clear. I, I, I'm fine with this. I actually like the nominee. I think he does a good job, but it's not my job to make that decision. I trust the president and our senators to do that very well. Uh, but I want to ask the administration. Um, there's sort of a, a one could take away from this that perhaps that we can't get anything done on our DOJ CASA work uh, while we have an acting uh, U.S. attorney. But we've been in this position before. Has there been any instance since um, under the new administration, under an acting U.S. attorney, where we have not been able to have access to the U.S. attorney or had robust conversations and uh, participation by the U.S. attorney's office in uh, any matter, including our DOJ issues, CASA issues? Um, Mr. President, Councilor Davis, no, that there has not been. Uh, in regards to the settlement agreement, we deal uh, mainly with Maine Justice, yeah. with the Special Litigation Division, although also with one um, full-time person here in Albuquerque, um, and you know, we, we interact with them nearly every day, and there's, there's been no instance where we haven't been able to communicate with them, and including some of the discussions you're referencing and, and in regard to other cases as well. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and Mr. President, I, I wanted to make that point. I think my experience has been that as we've been in these meetings and when we participate, when the administration participates, that's generally been with Maine Justice in D.C., um, they've got their team together on this, as, as somebody alluded to, the Attorney General's uh, made some uh, uh, some policy decisions or indications that they want to move forward and, and looking at some of these issues, and we're doing that with those folks, and we've participated in those meetings. I don't specifically believe that, uh, that having a permanent U.S. attorney would impact that discussion or, or change that in any direction. Uh, I think we're making good progress on our CASA. I see it every day. We saw it earlier. We started our meeting today that we're focusing on the things that are need to be focused on and uh, making up for lost time. So that said, um, I, I think this nominee is excellent. I think he'll be great. And if we can throw our support that way and get some attention to it, maybe somehow the city council in Albuquerque manages to break through the impasse uh, in the U.S. Senate with this, I think it's well worth our try and effort. So let's do it. Councilor Grout. Thank you all. <laughs> I just want the best for our city. And um, I want to support our police. 
and I want to support um, the city. And so anything we can do to help, let's do it. I urge your support. All right. There's a motion and a second for M3. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. Opposed? Okay, that passes on a 7 to 2 vote. <clears throat> we'll move on now to the uh, item F, Councilor Passan, Davis, and Lewis, R29. Mr. President. Councilor Passan. Thank you, Councilors. Thank you, Mr. President. R29 is staying enforcement. I would like to move R29, staying enforcement of the provisions of the alcoholic liquor ordinance that limit the availability of public celebration permits to certain license holders. I would like to move a due pass. Second. Second from Councillor Davis. And Mr. President. And uh, yeah, proceed. Thank you. I know that we do have some public comment, but and probably they will do a much better job at this than I will, but. I think that this has come to our attention that we're just not, we, we haven't updated our city liquor ordinance to match with the state, but it is causing some, what could probably be argued as colossal problems for some of the either vendors or fundraisers or patrons in Albuquerque, because we're just kind of behind the ball. So this is eventually, I'm looking forward to working with the other, my other colleagues here and trying to make sure that we get the liquor ordinance up to speed and in, in match with the state. Uh, let's, we're going to go ahead and hear from, uh, uh, do we have public comment on this? So let's go, go ahead with that, and then uh, we'll hear from the administration. Thank you, Mr. President. We have one person signed up, and it is Sarah Lister. Thank you, President Benton. Uh, my name is Sarah Lister. I'm the president and CEO of the Make-A-Wish Foundation of New Mexico. You may wonder why I would come here to talk to you about this specific issue. It's because every year we host an event um, that is our major fundraiser that helps us grant life-changing wishes for children battling critical illnesses. We do this event at the Sid Cutter Pavilion um, at the Balloon Grounds, and we work with different vendors um, in order to make this event as inexpensive as possible so that all of the funds that we raise go, goes towards granting those life-changing wishes. Um, we have gotten the permits in the past with no issues using the exact same location and the exact same vendors. Um, and this year it was brought to our attention that our permit would not be approved because there was this issue in the ordinance. Um, our event is next month. Uh, we turned everything in on time, um, weren't told that there were any issues until a couple of weeks ago. And so we certainly appreciate you all bringing this forward. Councilor Bassan has been wonderful to work with, along with other members of the council, uh, just to make sure that our event is able to go forward and we're able to raise funds to grant wishes for kids in New Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lister. Uh, councilors, back to the council for discussion. Actually, I wanted to ask the administration if they're supportive. Mr. President, members of the council, we, we support the change. It, uh, we uh, also realize that there is some changes that need to happen to the ordinance, and we concur with the approach. All right. Thank you. Councilors, other discussion? Councilor Bassan? Thank you, Mr. Lewis. President. Thank you, Councillor Lewis and Councillor Davis for being willing to co-sponsor this as well. Um, I mean, come on, how can you say no to those make-a-wish kids? <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, you know, I definitely want to also say to the public that are watching, this is not us saying we're not going to enforce liquor laws in Albuquerque. This is still us following the laws and making sure that we are continuing the permitting process. It just means that we can we can figure out how to make everything correct while putting a little pause while making sure that these applications still come through with some oversight, not just letting everyone go run amok and do what they want wherever they want. Um, so with that being said, uh, I urge your support. All right. We will go to a vote. All those in favor of R29, say yes and raise your hand. Opposed? That passes unanimously. And seeing no further business, this city council meeting is adjourned.